I welcome Dr. R.B. Sharma, who is our chief speaker for the day. Dr. R.B. Sharma teaches postmodern literary theory, gender studies, and stylistics and discourse analysis at the Department of English and Modern European Languages, University of Lucknow. He obtained his PhD degree under the supervision of Professor Charu Shil Singh, MG Kashi Vidya Peet Varanasi, on the topic idea of canon in Paul Demand's literary theory. He has published two books, Canon After Deconstruction, Paul Demand's Perspective, and English Studies in India, Contemporary and Evolving Paradigms. He has published more than 20 research articles in national and international journals. His current research interests are in the areas of philosophy of language, psychoanalysis, cognitive poetics, and post theory nature of literary text. I now request our principal ma'am to welcome sir. Uh, a very good morning to everyone present here. I welcome Dr. R.B. Sharma, Associate Professor, Department of English and Modern European Languages, University of Lucknow. And all the organizers of this lecture from the Department of English, Avad Girls Degree College, Dr. Ranjana Krishna, Dr. Seema Singh Katyar, Ms. Diksha Sharma, Ms. Ansh Sharma, and Ms. Devanshi Bhatnagar. And I welcome all the students and uh, my lots of best wishes for this program. Uh, you can please continue. Thank you. I now request Dr. R.B. Sharma to help us understand postmodernism better. Uh, thank you, Devanshi. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, at the outset, I thank the Avad Girls Degree College Administration, especially uh, Principal Madam, for giving me this opportunity to share my ideas on this platform. I think Dr. Randina Krishna, the head of the department for making this event possible. And uh, today's topic uh, is, uh, I think one of the very relevant topics for studies, for research, and for, in general, uh, for academia. And why I say so, uh, am I audible? Is there any technical glitches, any problems anywhere? No, sir, you're audible. Okay, fine. Uh, many of my uh, students have joined. It's a, such a uh, great thing to see their faces again. Uh, and I was pointing out that uh, Jameson is important for us as academicians uh, because when we uh, are dealing with knowledge, especially in literature, when we are trying to interpret uh, literary texts, one of the important thing is to understand the context, the times, the intellectual environment. And I think there's a lot of ambiguity, complexity in the present times about the age in which we are living. What kind of age is this? Uh, what Jameson does is he presents us a critical intellectual understanding of the past and the present. Uh, the, the past, as we know, uh, we call that modernism, or modernity that is started from the uh, in the mid of the 15th century 
and continued till 1960s. That also has different shades, various shadows, various interpretations. There's a simplified interpretation that we all have consumed. We all believe in that simplified uh, understanding of that period. Because if you look at literature and knowledge as a whole, uh, the, the times between uh, from 15th century till the 19th, till the middle of the 20th century uh, is considered as one chunk, as one, uh, uh, one part of the, 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 the history of ideas. After the 1960s, uh, the age that we call postmodernism is considered to be different. And this age also has been interpreted, uh, has been interpreted in, in a way uh, that perhaps it is some simplified understanding of the postmodernism. Uh, this simplification of these two terms, modernity and postmodernity, modernism and postmodernism, this is what is questioned by Jameson uh, in this essay, which is prescribed for our third semester PG students called The Politics of Theory, Ideological Positions in the Postmodernism -post Debate. So uh, this essay is precisely prescribed for one reason that we put the, the debates, the discussions of modernism and postmodernism in the right perspective. Now, one big difficulty that I face uh, in my classes is that there is a lot of, uh, uh, sometimes there is a complete ignorance and sometimes there is a kind of misunderstanding that prevails amongst the students about uh, the kind of the topics uh, that are related to modernism and postmodernism. You know, even in modernism, uh, sometimes the age that many of the, the thinkers believe that begins with, the, uh, uh, with 1798 and continues till uh, uh, 1970s. And sometimes uh, the whole of that, uh, beginning with the Renaissance till the mid of the, uh, uh, till the mid of the, the 20th century, that is taken as one, uh, uh, one part. So uh, uh, this simplified understanding of these two uh, kinds of the times in which we have uh, created knowledge, which we, we understand that knowledge in a particular perspective, that is uh, intellectually, critically assessed by Frederick Jameson in this essay. So my aim today in this lecture is going to be first to just for the sake of the students uh, to make them understand what these two terms mean. And then I will come to this essay to uh, take up the ideas of Frederick Jameson on uh, modernism and postmodernism. Uh, so uh, Devanshi, can you uh, like share the slides? Yes, sir. I'll just do it, sir. Okay. So Diksha is sharing this uh, screen. Okay. Uh, the first slide, can I see this? Okay. Uh, you, know, you know, in the beginning, I have given one line from Frederick Jameson, always history science. Uh, that this line is basically to give you an idea that what Frederick, Frederick Jameson actually tried to do in his writings, in his scholarship. Uh, he's primarily uh, a Marxist critic, uh, cultural critic, uh, who looks at the present age, age from a different perspective. So this one-liner should give you a basic idea. Okay, uh, next slide. 
Okay, so what I have done is I have taken this, uh, uh, this uh, basic picture to uh, give a general idea of the times which have gone by in uh, the history of uh, the ideas or history of mankind. Uh, we have become, uh, you know, uh, communicating human beings uh, in that sense, in the, in the sense in which we use the term now, uh, from somewhere around, though uh, uh, the recent researchers say that the, the communication began around, or the use of some kind of science for communication began around 70,000 years back. But I have taken that uh, age from 10,000 to 1450 BC. Uh, uh, from 10,000 BC to uh, 1450 AD. And that age was primarily the age of agriculture, handwork, and there were uh, the feudal system in the society, and there was like there were self-sufficient groups. There was a kind of uh, you know religious system that was prevailing, and the people were believing uh, in the in the, the tribal culture of the. So that was a different kind of age. Now, what happens after 1450, uh, the age from where the knowledge starts growing and there is a, a, a secular understanding of life where the human beings come at the center. The religion, even the religion was considered to be for the human beings. So a different image of human beings, that earlier the image of the human being was that the human beings are there on this planet for some kind of sin and they have to, you know, uh, live for uh, doing some kind of atonement for the sin and then uh, the whole life was considered from that perspective. Uh, in the Renaissance, human being occupied the central stage and the human being was viewed in a certain way. That viewing was that human being is creative. He is capable of making a change. He is born with certain capacities. He is stable, rational. All these things get uh, accumulated to the idea of the human uh, in the due course of time. And uh, there's another character of, the, of that age, New Enlightenment, German New Enlightenment, we all know, uh, which insisted on the, the central stage of the human being. And uh, uh, there, there was a kind of industrialization uh, the, the capitalist system came into existence and uh, uh, the creativity of human beings in art and other uh, art fields like uh, painting, music, all grew and the human being uh, found uh, a new definition for itself, a rational, um, a creative, stable, organizing, taking charge of life, etc. And God or religion was viewed in a different way. Uh, we all know what happened with the origin of the species when the human being was considered uh, uh, not as uh, created by God, but coming into life slowly through evolution. Uh, these ideas, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the growth of science, technology, uh, capital, uh, the, the urbanization, all these things, they created a different perspective of life. He, suddenly, a belief in the rationality of the human being, in the capacity of the human being, found enormous support system from the intellectuals. And that is what we call modernism. Belief in knowledge, rationality, stability, creativity, uh, 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 industrial production, all this, the, the, the modernity became the, the definition of the understanding of the human life. Now, this uh, understanding of human life uh, was working fine for some time, but there, were, there was discontent with this understanding of human life. There was a kind of new understanding uh, as I told you about that origin of species in 1859, and from there, 
you know, the two world wars that we fought and arrival of Marx, Freud, Freud suddenly uh, announced that it is not the conscious which is by which we can understand the human uh, being. It is the unconscious which carries the reality of the human being. Marx considered the, 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 the prevailing system as dissatisfactory because it is inequal. Uh, it, 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 it creates a kind, it leaves out a larger population of human beings uh, as a slavery to the capitalist system. So his understanding of the whole, these, uh, these philosophers, these uh, intellectuals, they were already creating a kind of discontent with the understanding of the modernity. But around the 1950s, uh, uh, when the, when the, uh, the, the, the new uh, discoveries in, uh, in the study of language, linguistics, they considered that the, the, uh, the language which was believed to be the, uh, the meta medium of, of creativity, that meta medium was deconstructed by the new uh, thinkers on language. They considered that language is not the medium of the great ideas. In fact, it is the language itself that creates the ideas. So the owners of the language, those who control the use of language, they are the creators of ideas. They are also the, uh, the, the controllers of the cultural uh, capital. This word cultural capital is important to understand in the present times because it's not just the wealth that is capital, but the whole culture, uh, 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 which is the culture of the, of the mainstream dominant groups, that itself functions as a capital for, uh, for, for certain groups to dominate the, the, the human uh, society. So uh, uh, there were questions of all kinds of creativity. Newer uh, um, isms evolved. Feminism, post-colonialism, uh, uh, Dalitism, all these theories which were questioning the established patterns of the already existing, they were taking the ideas from different domains of knowledge and putting that together to question the established notions of society and culture. Uh, this, uh, this, this, this is called postmodernism. That, uh, uh, that 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 one name that we give that uh, Lyotard defined that as uh, questioning of the meta narratives. We now the problem with this idea of the postmodernism is that that somehow we are still living in modernism. Modernism hasn't gone away. Now there's a just one minute. I'll just take water and continue. So uh, the problem with the, the ambiguity and the confusion of the present society and the intellectuals and uh, those who are engaged with the research is that uh, those hallmarks of the modernism or something that we call classical modernism or uh, high modernism, that creativity, rationality, um, and uh, purpose of life, etc., reasoning of life, uh, that, that those hallmarks are still with us. Otherwise, there is a problem with the whole society. But simultaneous with that, though, that, that kind of understanding of society is functioning, with that, there's another kind of view also, that view that I was talking about, the postmodernist understanding of the society, that is also functioning. So this ambiguity or this confusion is prevailing. 
and there are some intellectuals who are on the side of the postmodernist understanding of the society and culture of the present times and there are others who are still sticking to the uh, modernity as we understand you know one very important thing that i would like uh, your attention to come is that there's a there is a school of um, literary criticism or literary school that is known as modernist school that began uh, in literature from 1920s and continued till uh, 1940s and 50s and probably it is still continuing uh, depending on how you understand modernity and how you read the the, the literature of the present times so uh, that ambiguity that confusion or that problematic of the modernism and postmodernism is dealt by uh, Frederick Jameson in his writings. Uh, for the sake of the simplicity, I have uh, taken up the division of the uh, modernism and postmodernism further in my next presentation. Uh, Devanshi, can we have the next slide, please? Yes. So uh, let us look at the different uh, things. Uh, which are uh, you know, juxtaposed with the other thing. So modernism was dealing with the object uh, and the same thing becomes in postmodernism as image or symbol. Uh, there is a Cartesian subject in modernism, Cartesian subject with reasoning, reasoning and uh, uh, objective, etc. And that, be, that subject of the self becomes symbolic subject in postmodernism. Uh, Cognitive means the one who is understanding and uh, making sure sense of the things. That subject becomes semiotic subject in postmodernism. Unified subject becomes fragmented self in postmodernism. Centered subject becomes decentered. I already talked about these things in my uh, in the in the initial remarks. Uh, signified belief in the meaning that becomes the belief only in the signifier. That is the medium of the. Objectification becomes symbolization. Representation becomes only signification. Truth, objective truth, that comes to become the constructive truth. We all know about that. There's a lot of talk about the post-truth or manufactured truth. In the media studies, we all come across these terms. You know, these days, there's a huge crisis about whether the truth is there or not. Uh, problem is that the truth is created by the by, by the by the signifying systems and the signifying systems are controlled by certain uh, organizations and that kind of truth we consume those meanings and that becomes uh, the truth for us so there's a lo lot of debate on the post truth and manufactured truths uh, that's why this real becomes hyper real we all know about uh, simulcra and uh, simulcrum uh, images, etc. Universalism that becomes localism. Society as a structure becomes society as a spectacle. Now, this uh, you know the, the the idea of a spectacle is very important. Like like we all are probably uh, believing in what we see, uh, and that belief is a problem. Uh, why that is a problem? Because today the medium of a spectacle is there in our pocket and those who know that a spectacle can create truths, they, uh, uh, they stream the, the spectacles in our mobiles, in our TVs and we become what we see. So that is spectacle, uh, society as a spectacle has, has taken a different dimension. Logocentric reason becomes hermetic reason that we interpret the things and that what the interpretation is becomes the, the actual uh, uh, thing that we have. Knowing becomes communicating. Economy is closely now becomes culture. That culture is part of the economic system. Uh, capitalism, uh, you know, th this term is very important. Capitalism until the 1950s was used for uh, a uh, a kind of industrial uh, system in which the wealth was used to produce uh, 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 jobs for producing um, uh, consumable items for the for the betterment of the humanity. 
But now this is in late capitalism, this word I'll come back to again, because uh, uh, Frederick Jameson uses late capitalism uh, in his book also, in the book in which this article was published. So what this late capitalism actually means, that we need to uh, understand it. Uh, okay, I, instead of um, like delaying it, let me talk about late cap capitalism a bit. You know, what has happened in the present times, we are living in the times of uh, late capitalism. Uh, this word uh, was used by a German economist, um, Werner Sombart. Uh, he used this word for indicating the absurdities of the capitalist system, where the inequalities between in the, amongst the human society has grown, there, is a, there are contradictions of the, the, the aims and objectives for which the capitalism you know, keeps on harping that it is for the welfare of the human beings. There's a crisis, there are injustices, inequalities, etc. Uh, the modern uh, business uh, uh, model uh, is creating a deep crisis in the human society precisely because it is uh, it is increasing the inequalities uh, in the social system. So that's what that's how the economy, uh, you know, uh, this capitalism uh, becomes late capitalism. Uh, economic system becomes symbolic system because there is a lot of um, uh, emphasis on controlling the symbolic systems. You know, controlling the media, controlling the uh, the people who are uh, creating knowledge, etc. And production becomes consumption. We are consuming societies in the postmodernist times. Uh, next slide, Devanshi. Okay. I'm sorry, I have to take water sometimes. Uh, uh, shift from use of value to exchange value. Uh, you know, earlier there was uh, only, uh, you know, value of in the real terms was counted. Now the value is counted in terms of what it can give you back that idea. Earlier there was an emphasis on science and technology in modern time, modernism, and now there's only technology. This technocracy, the word that is being used these days, that technology is ruling our lives and how problematic it is becoming, how harmful it is becoming. In fact, you know, because of the techno, uh, technocracy or technology, we are becoming illiterate again. Instead of using our minds to understand the things we are using, the, we are getting the ready-made uh, solutions for everything. And there is a real crisis that in future, the human beings might lose their capacities, uh, intellectual capacities. Uh, this is another uh, issue in postmodernism. Uh, mechanical technology becomes digital communicative technology. Euro-American centrism Go, you know, earlier there was a kind of idea that all the knowledge systems and great ideas exist in the in European centuries, uh, countries or in the American American system. Now today we understand that the the, the great ideas, the great knowledge systems can come from uh, um, any corner of the society uh, of of the world. Uh, so we use the term globalism, uh, orientalism, colonialism in earlier times. Now today we talk about multiculturalism and globalism, etc. Okay, uh, so this is uh, basically uh, the, the point that I, that this is how the two modernism and postmodernism uh, concepts of the times in which we, are, we have lived and we are living are viewed. Now this, uh, uh, this division of modernism and postmodernism, uh, is you know juxtaposed with each other and it seems this gives us an idea that as if there's a there's a stark difference between modernism and postmodernism and somehow this 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 change historical change that has happened is permanent and the the, the breakage from the modernist times is complete and the, there's no reversal there's no uh, 
you know, flow from the modernist times to the postmodernist times. Now, this kind of understanding is, uh, uh, has to be reviewed. Frederick Jameson, is, in his article, reviews this kind of division of, the, or, 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 of his historicity or historical times between modernism and postmodernism. So, it is first we need to understand that uh, what kind of division is this that I have given you kind of list. And then we have to understand why this is problematic and why uh, Frederick Jameson is, is taking another view of uh, this, this idea. So in this essay, which is prescribed for our MA students, uh, a different understanding of these terms or a different uh, critique is presented. So the, the, the critical understanding of this uh, that Frederick Jameson uh, presents in this essay, uh, that is what I'm going to do now in the time that is left to me. Uh, uh, Devanshi, can we have next slide? So who is uh, Frederick Jameson? An American literary critic, philosopher, a Marxist political thinker. He's one of the serious thinkers on postmodernity and late capitalism. I have already given you some idea that uh, what this, what he is doing. Uh, for Jameson, postmodernity amounts to an immense dilation of uh, culture's sphere and the sphere of commodities, an immense uh, and historically original consideration of the real. So what he is saying is that, uh, the, uh, you know, Lacanian term real, uh, real something that is not yet symbolized in human life. That, uh, uh, you know, th that, that even that is becoming a culture. Even that is brought in the uh, in the domain of symbolic representations. He, you know what basically he's saying in simple terms is that uh, even the things which were earlier considered to be outside the symbolic system of the human communicative um, paraphernalia, even that is considered to be. You know that that, that that there is an attempt to signify even that. So uh, he he says that you know that, that that kind of attempt is sometimes facile, sometimes futile. Um, so what he's saying is that that that, that the, the, this whole uh, category of postmodernism is problematic uh, because there's a lot that flows from the from modernism into postmodernism and he believes that sometimes the kind of the you know the uh, the terminologies that are used to describe postmodernism that fractured humanity or crisis of the humanity etc etc this can be these terms are used to escape the real issues of life and the possibility of intervention in life that by inter by intervention what i mean that there is a possibility of creating a bringing a change in life because if you believe in uh, the, if you have complete belief in postmodernist understanding of life then probably you accept that now whatever has happened there is a crisis and we can't do anything about it and that is anti marxist understanding in the sense that Marxism believes that we can intervene to bring a positive change in life. So that's why he's critical of postmodernism. He believes that modernism was still, you know, uh, believing in doing something, uh, something to bring a change in life. But he was, he's also critical of um, the debates that surround around classical modernism or high modernism. Next slide, Devanshi. Just a minute. So, uh, what are the arguments in this? Basic arguments in the book in which this article was published. Uh, there are uh, this. Uh, the book name is Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism. That was published in 1991. This article was published earlier. Before that, the article that is that is described 
this article was published in a journal called New German Critique, uh, number 33. Uh, uh, th that was published in 1984 from page 53 to 65. Um, so this was republished in this, this article, which is prescribed for us, uh, that was republished in this book, Postmodernism or Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, which was published in 1991. So there are a few basic arguments of this, that what has happened is that debates on the postmodernism have done is that they have weakened the idea of historical existence. What uh, Jameson is saying is that, you know, postmodernism, uh, by the kind of the debates that surround this, uh, does, what it does is that it weakens our, our uh, uh, understanding of the historical existence. Uh, it means that uh, the postmodernism somehow makes us uh, believe that we are living in trans-historic times, the fluid times, there is fluidity, everything goes, uh, everything is acceptable, there is no grand narrative, let us not get into any kind of, uh, you know, um, um, a, a, a motive of doing something for the, for saving or for creating something different. So, this weakening of historical sense uh, is problematic for Jameson because he believes that we need to look at the past so that can teach us something uh, so that we can do something to bring a positive change in life. That is one. Second argument is a, a breakdown of the distinction between high and low culture. One that thing has happened to us is that we have in the postmodernist times uh, all kinds of uh, art forms or all kinds of communications have equal value. That the postmodernists believe that uh, the high and low culture, are the, uh, you know, they are equal and we need to uh, give equal value to all kinds of cultural uh, manifestations. The third thing that this primarily talks about is that postmodernists believe that this, that there's, there's no uh, great idea, this complete deathlessness that prevails in the system. And the fourth that, uh, uh, thing is that there's a uh, regime of technology or something that we call technocracy. So these are the basic things that, are, you know, uh, the, the, the thesis statements of this book. The one sheet, uh, next, okay. Uh, so the politics of theory, ideological positions in the Postmodernism debate. I have, uh, you know, uh, I've tried to break it down into some points, though it's a very difficult, uh, you know, uh, style of writing. Ideas are not difficult. You know, one of the things that we need to understand is that ideas in such essays are not that difficult as they seem to be. The problem is with the style of writing. And uh, here I'll just, you know, divert a bit, saying that. Uh, so when we say that the style is very difficult, we are unable to understand and it is a difficult language, etc., etc. Please understand one important aims of literary studies. And the aim is to, uh, you know, uh, get a feel of language in every kind of usage. A, a student of literature cannot just, uh, you know, seek journalistic language or cannot just seek uh, poetic language. Uh, one, we have to learn to understand the critical language as well. So this language that uh, Jameson and the recent critics that they use uh, sometimes becomes very abstruse, but uh, that is a, a challenge and a challenge for us uh, to make our students uh, understand that you have to confront it, take it, maybe you read, you understand a bit of it, but uh, you would ultimately gain this confidence of making sense of the difficult uh, language also. So it's, a, uh, it's not difficult in terms of its content, it's difficult in terms of only its language and the style of writing. Uh, so I have tried to you know, break it down. Uh, what it says is that 
there are problems of postmodernism. Uh, the first thing that this essay says is that uh, the, the whole idea of the postmodernism is problematic uh, because the fundamental problem, the, what are the, its characteristics, even that is problematic. We have not yet completely, uh, you know, um, clarified that these, these, these are the, uh, the characteristics of uh, postmodernism. Uh, we are not even sure whether it exists or um, um, uh, what is the vision of history in its articulation or uh, uh, the, to view the present times as postmodern uh, affirms two basic characteristics that it is consumer society and it is late capitalism. So there is a problem of the, with the whole concept of postmodernism. That is the first point that he makes. The next point that he makes is postmodernism exists in oppositional relationship with high or classical modernism. He says that most of the thinkers on postmodernism, whenever they are talking about postmodernism, they always relate with this with modernism, as if the postmodernism does not have its own characteristics. So every sense that we can make of postmodernism is always in relation to modernist um, uh, concept of the times. The next point that he makes is the aesthetic debates are also political as far as the debates on postmodernism are concerned. Examples he gives are Yahav uh, Hassan's, you know, his, write, his writings and then his general telquence attack on the ideology of representation, Heidegger or Derrida's uh, understanding of end of metaphysics. Now, what the point that he makes? He says that uh, the two things are mixed. Uh, whenever we are talking about postmodernism, we mix up the aesthetic response and the political response. This is, I think, one of the uh, you know, very important things in our research also in literary research, that how to segregate the aesthetic response from the political response. Uh, one of the, I just digress a bit. Uh, one of the issues, you know, when we do research on uh, the feminist study of, of literature, uh, th that feminism is, is, is a basically a political issue, a political uh, uh, question. Uh, but in literature, we are, you know, dealing primarily with the aesthetics. So how this, the two have become, uh, you know, they have conjoined and they have become somehow one. And there's a, uh, when the thinkers are talking about it, they do not uh, keep the two separate. And that creates a kind of ambiguity and confusion. Um, uh, this uh, Jameson is not saying that we need to uh, segregate them too, but what he's saying is that that those who mix the two together, they need to understand that the two always have been together. It is not that high modernism was not concerned with the political issues. The high modernism, though it was you know, insisting on the innovations in the formalistic uh, uh, formalistic features, but even that was a kind of political statement. How it was a political statement? Because it was considering that, now you need to pay attention to what I am saying, that, you know, there's a decadence in the society and that decadence in the society and the political system can be rectified, can be uh, corrected by innovations in art. If you look at the modernism that, you know, from 1920s to uh, 1950s, that whole, you know, the, 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 the whole um, effort uh, of making innovations in form, formalistic features of literature, they were basically like, like, like the wasteland. You know, when the kind of the poetry that is written in the wasteland or Ulysses, that Basically, it's a high kind of uh, 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 modernism uh, making an, uh, a statement that this artistic innovation or artistic achievement can 
do something to to change the social decadence it can recover it can uh, it can give a different impetus to 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 correct the decadence that prevails in the social and cultural system uh, 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 t s eliot's whole idea of his poetry is this only that the decadence in the society can be rectified can be corrected with poetry or with uh, with, with literature so even this is a political statement it is a social commitment to of literature so high modernism is not dissociated from uh, social commitment as it is believed to be that is uh, that, that is the point that he is talking about in his third point now he gives the examples of um, uh, from architecture tom bulfer's example of his book uh, from bauhaus to our house uh, that he was against uh, you know he uh, he gives all kinds of arguments uh, against the modernist uh, art and he celebrates the post modernism uh, there is also a kind of debate uh, in in, in uh, thinkers like habermas and uh, and they want to you know they want to correct the vices of the post modernism from taking the ideals of equality civil rights humanitarianism free speech open media etc from the, uh, the 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 modernist uh, uh, you know tenets and uh, uh, they believe that this is what is thwarted by capitalism and that can be uh, you know rec recovered uh, by taking into uh, by taking help from the uh, uh, from modernism next slide devanshan yes uh, he takes this you know um, the ideas of uh, franco uh, luther where uh, he you know luther's definition of um, post modernism as uh, a kind of uh, uh, disbelief in uh, in meta narratives uh, even luther wanted to assimilate high modernism with post modernism to make it uh, socially beneficial uh he continues giving these examples of lukacs uh manfredo the furi uh, who indulges in all kinds of paradoxes he wants to transform the world by transforming its form space language uh, but he also insists now the furi's uh, in inconsistency or paradoxes he points out by saying that on the one hand he is saying that uh, by 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 transforming the language the world can be transformed on the other hand he says that it is impossible to transform the world and the society without doing any radical transformation in the in the social relations so what is the conclusion that he comes to i have just quoted a few things from there the conclusion is that the, the uh, this is in his own words the point is that we are within the culture of postmodernism to the point where it's facile repudiation a repudiation as is as impossible as any equally facile celebration of it complacent and corrupt so what the point that he is making is that uh, let us not get into uh, either discarding postmodernism or celebrating postmodernism both are uh, unnecessary we need to look at this from a different point of view and what is the point of view that he wants us to look at it in place of the temptation either to denounce the complacencies of postmodernism as some final symptom of decadence or to salute uh, the new forms as the harbingers of a new technological or technocratic utopia it seems more appropriate to assess the new cultural production within the working hypothesis of a general modification of culture itself within the social restructuring of late capitalism as a system so what he is saying is this that instead of trying to uh, like compartmentalize the the, the modernism and postmodernism instead of denouncing them as one or the other what we need to do is we need to create uh, a different functional definitions of these two to understand how can we modify the culture how can we do some kind of restructuring of late capitalism by which we can uh, you know infuse 
some hope, some kind of uh, social reformation so that the kind of the crisis in which we are now because of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the kind of the capitalist system in which we are living, this is some kind of new hope can be generated by modifying the whole debate. So he says, uh, add the ter third term to the whole debate. And that term he says is realism. Let us realistically look at what is happening to us in the present time. And can we do, can we look at culture, literature, and the, 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 the ruling ideas of the present critically and point out that what is the problem with these ideas? How it is not beneficial to the larger sections of the society? How it has become a problematic for the people who are below that high culture that we call, you know, that lives in its own utopia of its own making, not something that is connected with the ground realities of life in the present time. So that's the end, it, end of it. Thank you very much. I would be welcoming any questions that you may have. Thank you, sir. That was such an intellectually intriguing session. Thank you for that. From the Descartian, I think, therefore I am, to the Sartrean, I exist, therefore I am, to the postmodern, I am and I am not. I now move, moving on to the question answer session. I now call upon Anushka to ask her first question. And I request all the participants to please post their questions in the chat box if they have not, so that we can moderate the session. Anushka, please go ahead. Okay, uh, I think there's some technical glitch, so I will take her question. She says, good morning, sir. I have a question. Sir, in one of the slides, difference between modern and postmodern was mentioned. So, sir, are we living in the modern world or postmodern world? <laughs> Anushka, uh, that is the whole debate that Frederick Jameson is, uh, you know, indulging in. He says that it is wrong to uh, you know, give such uh, uh, names uh, with such clarity, where uh, the you know the the stable names become problematic. We are simultaneously living. If you like, we have to intellectually and critically look at our, our, our times. We are simultaneously living in uh, you know uh, we are living in a reasonable world. We are living in a world that by in which we uh, make sense of the uh, of the world from our mind there's an intellectual perception we believe that there is a truth but at the same time we also know that this the truth is being ma manufactured by certain uh, you know um, uh, certain uh, uh, very uh, controlling powers or controlling systems of uh, communications so uh, uh, depending what you're doing, accordingly, you can define whether this is, you know, a postmodernist uh, conceptualization or we are in the times of postmodernism or we, we, are, we are, you know, uh, uh, living with uh, reason and rationality. So uh, this whole, uh, uh, you know, uh, compartmentalization is problematic. That is what Jameson is trying to do in this essay, actually. Thank you, sir. Next, we have a question by Hera Jalali. And she says, sir, how does Jameson's ideology differ from Louis Althusser's ideas? OK. Uh, Louis Althusser is basically a descriptive critic in the sense that uh, he is trying to, uh, you know, trying to make us understand what ideology is and how it functions. It's material nature and it's imaginary nature. 
that the complete definitions that he gives in, in his writings. Uh, Jameson is a, a Marxist in the sense that he he wants the change in the in the cultural system. He critiques the culture to bring a change. There's a difference between describing something and uh, attempting to make a change. So Jameson uh, is basically, uh, you know, what we call organic intellectual. The one who is associating with the society to make a change and not just, uh, you know, theorizing on, on ideology. Thank you, sir. Next, we have a question by Siddiq Khan, who's asking, how can we see this whole discourse of postmodernism in terms of post-truth era? Uh, this post-truth era, you know, th this again, this, the term post-truth, as if there is a post-truth everywhere. You know, this is again kind of uh, uh, nomenclature, problematic nomenclature. Post-truth, no doubt, there are, you know, things in our life, we all know how the truth is being created uh, by, you know, the relationship between power and truth, etc., between the power to control the representative, representational systems, communicative systems, etc., etc. All this is there. But that does not mean that the concept of truth has completely gone. That concept of truth is still there. We need to believe to make our life meaningful. Otherwise, what will happen is like we all start believing that life is meaningless. We are in fluid situation. We are completely uh, disoriented, um, uh, you know, fractured, fluid, etc. That does not, uh, you know, that, 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 that will be problematic. It will bring another kind of crisis. So this, when we read literature, even when we read, do, you know, uh, when we interpret literature, if we start looking at literature from the post-modernist point of view alone, then the whole meaning of literature will evaporate. Then, you know, life will evaporate, literary studies will evaporate, the pursuit of knowledge will evaporate. So this must be kept. What we need to do is we need to understand where is the problem, critique that, and then bring sanity to our, your own, uh, you know, interpretative system, hermeneutic exercise that we are all doing, we are doing in our own research or teaching. Uh, yeah, next. Thank you, sir. The next question is by Vedamini Vikram. And uh, she asked the solution he's proposing still seems very vague. What exactly he means by realism? By trying to alter culture, aren't we again starting the entire cycle of creating signifiers? Uh, yeah, see, uh, what he is doing is, he says that, uh, let us not forget the material existence of human life in the past. Let us not, uh, you know, um, assign everything to representation. So this understanding is important that human life has material existence. And there is also the existence of representations or narratives. And there is a relationship, close relationship between uh, narratives of life and the life as such. Like we have literature, there are narratives, imaginative narratives of life. We have other knowledge systems which are narratives of life and they're in a different sense. There's a material life that everybody lives from morning to evening in the way it is. The two are interconnected. They are dynamically interrelated to each other. Now, when he is talking about realism, he says he is basically what he is meaning is that look at both of them as real. What you know the, that that neither the narrative is imaginary, just imaginary, nor the the material is just material or real. Both need to be taken into account to understand the situation in a, from a point of view which should be used to make a change, not accept the, 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 the chaos. Like 
the kind postmodernism uh, you know may, makes us believe that there is a kind of chaos in uh, everywhere and we need to accept it and somehow flow with that that is where the problem is uh, and uh, th this kind of uh, classification of modernism postmodernism etc makes us believe that perhaps there was a kind of utopia in the past and today there is chaotic uh, the, the chaotic times it was never like this it was there, there were issues in the past there were there were all kinds of false narratives in the past and there are false narratives in the present as well we need to say we need to look at individual instances and uh, and make a critique from the point of view where we can put the things as they are to the people that's why realism he says always historicize like look at the past from the how from where the things began and how they are okay next the next question is by rohit and he says jameson as well as other marxists just a second sir can we just enter yes jameson and as well as other marxist thinkers are stressing on political aspect of literature but why is it then that professors and scholars in general are hesitant to take a political discourse and limit themselves to aesthetic aspect no i do not agree like all those who are doing uh, uh, the, the studies in the literature uh, feminist critics post colonialism they are all uh, you know uh, doing uh, they are taking political sides post colonialism is not uh, just just uh, aesthetic study it is a political study feminist is a political study uh, dalit theories uh, are in political studies uh, in fact i i have a different understanding that probably for these the, the, the kind of the buzzwords that we have in the research these days the aesthetic aspect of literature is actually taking the back seat that is um, sometimes i believe is a problematic also so the ha huh, the, the problem is that can we synthesize the two can we synthesize the the aesthetic and the political together can we stitch them together so when somebody is doing research in uh, the feminist study of literature i always you know have this question in my mind can this research scholar uh, you know stitch the aesthetics of feminism like they can one talk about uh, and there is a interesting thing if you look at helen sichu uh, uh, and other feminist critics they are basically saying this that there is a need to uh, look at the, not just the political uh, side of the the, the feminist uh, discourse but also uh, at the aesthetic side of the feminist discourse okay, okay. next and this is uh, with this this is the last question this is by shivam kundu and he says mm. can the coexistence of the ideas of modernism and postmodernism be seen in the frame of the rhizome that deleuze and guattari talk about i couldn't get the question he says can the coexistence of the ideas of modernism and postmodernism be seen in the frame of the rhizome that deleuze and guattari talk about no 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 rhizome is a kind of you know concept that believes in the uh, endless uh, weaving together like there's there's no one uh, beginning point or the end point everything is messed up together that this concept helps us in understanding the you know the problematic uh, functioning of culture and literature and other discourses but uh, again it uh, probably it suggests that uh, uh, we will be always in that that ambiguity and confusion and we there's no we can't extricate ourselves from this but that is not the idea of frederick jameson he believes that there is a there is a possibility of change thank you sir and with this we come to uh, the end of the question answer session i would now request ms salma banu student of ma third semester to propose the formal vote of thanks 
Salma, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone gathered here. First, I would like to thank our guest, Dr. R.B. Sharma, sir, for giving such an insightful lecture and for explaining everything beautifully and making it clear. It's a privilege to have you, sir. I also want to thank Dr. Onyal, Head Department of English and Modern European Languages, University of Lucknow, for being a part of this event. Our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Upma Chaturvedi, our principal ma'am, and our teachers, Dr. Krishna, Dr. Katyar, Diksha ma'am, Ansh ma'am, and Devanshi ma'am. Last but not the least, thanks to our organizing team for making this event a success. Thank you everyone and have a nice day. Thank you, Salma. I would like to request Dr. Krishna to please say a few lines. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much for this very insightful and intense lecture. Uh, you have made such compl all these complex terms so simple and so easy to understand for our students. We ha it's absolute delight to listen. It was actually an intellectual treat, and we all thoroughly enjoyed it, and, and we are enlightened. Uh, thank you so much. On behalf of the entire Avad family, I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to you. We are extremely grateful to Professor Unyal also for gracing the occasion and for joining us today. On this virtual platform, I can see many other family of faces. Smita is there. There are many faculty members and students from different colleges of uh, Lucknow University, from AMU, from BHU, from Mumbai University, and from uh, Uttaranchal, uh, and also from the city of Joy, Kolkata. So thank you all for joining us, and hope to see you all soon on another special lecture series. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you all. Before we end the event and this lecture, I would request everybody to please put on their videos so that we can take a group photograph for our records. Salma, please go ahead and take screenshots. Are we done, Salma? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. Thank you all. Great to see you all here. Uh, like old memories have come refreshed. Uh, you know, it looks like classroom. <laughs> we have Diksha, Priyanka, Mohit, uh, everyone, you know. Uh, so great to see you all. Thank you, Ranjana ji. It was Thank you. Uh, great to uh, give this opportunity to talk to the students again. You know, uh, it really made me so contented to share my ideas with all of you. Thank you Thank so you. much, sir. And we hope to have you again uh, once the, you know the campus opens. Uh, so not virtually, maybe on the campus we'll meet again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Devanshi, for organizing it. Welcome, ma'am. Ram Devanshi, please officially end the meeting yes. now.